Hello, everyone, and welcome to another super cool radio interview. I'm your host, Matthew Thomas. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have an incredible guest who I'm very excited to chat with here on the podcast. He's an incredible singer, songwriter, and musician. He's also the vocalist for Gray Days. And recently, he collaborated with Elias Soriano to form Arcade Assembly. Please welcome Chris Hodges. Why, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I know we had quite a bit to discuss, obviously, with Arcade Assembly, uh, Gray Days, and just everything else in between, so I really appreciate your time. It's awesome to have you on the podcast. I'm happy to be here, man. I, I appreciate you picking some time out for me and excited to talk to you. So this first question I wanted to ask, because I it's not music-related, but I did hear in a previous interview, you're a huge fan of wrestling, as am I. <laughs> yes. So, I'm curious for you, like, who are your, like, top three favorite all-time wrestlers? Easy. So, for number one is Sting. Sting was my favorite, all-time favorite, for multiple reasons. Um, the WCW was always, like, the underdog, you know what I'm saying? And so that was my thing. I loved WCW. And Sting and Big Van Vader, just like every year, they would have this epic match, like whatever, Bash at the Beach or whatever. And um, almost every year growing up, I was painting my face like Sting and, you know, all, all doing all that stuff. So Sting's my number one, always will be. Uh, number two is probably The Undertaker. And number three, I would probably go with... Mm, probably stone cold that is a very solid list now I, i'm curious so like obviously being a fan of sting what do you think of the joker character in uh, tna wrestling like i know it's very divisive either people love it or hate it so i'm curious for you so the thing about sting was he he picked already existing characters so the crow sting that yeah. was that was the crow the only character that it didn't seem like he was mimicking from another character was Beach Beach Sting. Um, but it followed the path of what he was doing. He was copying, he was copying, you know, modern day characters. I didn't really care for it, to be honest with you. I didn't think it was cool. Um, I thought it was interesting how he reinvented himself and it seemed to work for that period of time. But uh I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of feel that as well. Like, I thought at first, I thought it was like, okay, kind of, you know, again, different for the character. But I don't know. I feel like it kind of went on way too long and didn't really go anywhere. But that's my opinion. It was cool that, like, I guess he was considered a heel when he was when he was the Joker, yeah, because he was like haunting people. Um, you know, I I appreciated the direction, but uh, man, Crow Sting was my favorite beach sting was obviously the og so i'm gonna stick with those characters oh very nice very nice so now gonna gonna shift to music because this is a uh, music podcast now so good to start off with wrestling though bro that's a great way to start off a podcast hey i i'm a huge fan of wrestling like all the wrestling pit you know the i'm uh, more of wwe uh, i watch occasionally aw but um Definitely more of WWE. I got some friends together. Every pay per view, we hang out at, this, nice. at one of my friend's house. We eat pizza. We watch wrestling. I mean, what can go like? It's just the best thing. That's perfect. That's that's a great dude's night out, bro. Exactly. Well, I guess for me, real quick, uh, my top three. Like, obviously, Undertaker is my number one. He was the first character that like I like was drawn to just based on just how the cool factor and also the supernatural stuff he could do. Like when the lights go out, like oh my god, and, and then he shows up and. It's fantastic. Dude, the intro was, there was no better intro in the history of wrestling than Undertaker's intro. I agree. I agree. 
And then uh, second, I gotta go Randy Savage. I just oh, love wow. the whole character. Like he, like to me, like if you think of like eighties wrestling, obviously Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Ultimate Warrior. But like to me, like he nailed down the whole like just his gimmick, his personality. Like he like nailed like the whole um, like being able to talk on the mic very well. Agreed. He was probably the best on the mic that I've ever heard. Um, I mean, flawless, dude. Like I don't know if he was planning that stuff out, but he. It was, it was just, I was just like, every time he spoke, I was like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then the third one, a little bit different, but actually I did get to meet him. He was just so cool. Uh, Rob Van Dam. Oh, really? Yeah. He, he actually, um, he was part of TNA wrestling at the time and they did a show in my home city. Cause they were, so I'm like two hours, like east of Chicago in Indiana. So like they had a show like leading up to their pay-per-view in Chicago. I was like, well, it's like 10 minutes from my house. I might as well go. And it happened to be on my dad's birthday. So we took my dad and he had a great time. He, yeah. he really enjoyed. Uh, but like after he was at the Rob Van Dam was in the main event, it was like some tag team match. I don't remember. I think Rhino was there. I think some other people I don't remember, but, um, yeah. but uh, I was wearing a Rob Van Dam shirt and um, he was like walking around like the aisle way where we were. And uh, my brother's like, hey, can we get a photo? He's like, yeah, that guy's wearing an RVD shirt. Of course you can. Dude, that's awesome. Do you uh, do you remember Gangrel? Yes. Yeah. yeah so, so Gangrel uh, worked out at the gym that I worked out at. And really? yeah, we became friends. And he was like, he was trying. This was 2013. He was trying to get me to to like go to his school to become a professional wrestler. And I was like, dude, that would actually be really awesome. And uh, he was starting a he was starting a promotion out here in Hollywood, and he invited me to it. And Rob Dan Van Dam was there, um, and, and it was a bunch. It was like uh, I think Rikishi was performing, Gangrel, Rob Van Dam was there. Met all these guys. It was like my wife did, couldn't care less, but I was just like freaking out because it's all these guys I used to grow up with. <laughs> well, that that is so cool. So like. Um... So you just you're at the gym one day and you just see Grand Gangrel working out there? Yeah, I don't even think. Yeah, I I, I actually didn't know who he was, and um, I don't know. I can't remember how we started talking, and then he told me who he was. I was like, oh, dude. And so, and then now now I think he's down in Florida. I think he's got a school down I think in so, Florida. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, it was a great sidebar of our wrestling. I talk about <laughs> wrestling a lot, but I got to get to. So obviously, Arcade Assembly, as I said, collaboration with you and Elias. So like, how did this you know come about to to do our like Arcade Assembly and write and record music? Yeah, it's crazy, right? So Elias and I met through a business endeavor that we were both working on. It was a music. It was a music uh, in the music industry, but more on the distribution side. And we were both um, kind of working on this project alongside a couple of friends. And so we met doing that. Now, mind you, I grew up listening to Nonpoint. So Elias was always like a dude that I admired um growing up in my teens and everything and so just getting to work with him in this in this uh on this startup was a, a lot of fun for me and then like i had i was writing music um i was doing a solo project for for a while outside of the grade a stuff and i i came across i just like i had this song and the song had holes in it like i couldn't figure out um i couldn't figure out like some of these parts and so i just i was like you know what i'm just gonna hit up elias and see if he'd be into this because this is kind of his style i think this this would be cool and so i shot it over to him and like 20 minutes later he was like dude i got it and he recorded it and sent it back to me and it was like dude like a puzzle piece bro and we were like that's interesting like it hardly ever happens where we just you click like that and so we started talking about what we wanted to do outside of our current projects and i i've always been a guy that loves to collaborate and in, in lots of different genres and it seems like the era of music right now lends itself to that because people are cross genre collaborating now um, there, there's so many genres that it's like, it's all melting together. And so I was like, 
dude, what like what if we like not necessarily start a band, but what if we start an artist collective? What if we started this like Wu Tang clan of of rock artists and EDM artists and so we got together with a few producers. I have uh, an EDM producer that's that's writing the tracks with us. Um, there's a there's a producer in Brazil named Selva that we're working with right now that has contacts to the he's he he's in the gaming industry, so he writes for games and uh, like uh, just uh, uh, League of Legends and all that. And so we we're like, dude, let's just collaborate with as many people as we can. And that's kind of how Arcade Assembly took off is it is an artist collective, no genres, no rules, just writing good music with good people. Well, I really like because the obviously a big point you made with I think genres are becoming less and less defined, as you said. I definitely agree with that because there's just so much cool stuff. Like music should be like limitless with like yeah. what people can do. And I'm glad like to see that kind of cool collaborations, you know, obviously some people might not like it. Some people like it depends on people's taste, but I think um, it's cool to see like people starting to branch out more that they're not just like, you know, almost like typecast into they have to play metal. They have to play rock. We're seeing all these cool different genres, uh, like starting to, you know, not, not genre, but like, you know, styles of music that yeah, are starting to be recorded. And it's important for artists to be able to do that. Artists want to express themselves in multiple different ways. It's always been that way. But for the longest period of time, the record label needs you to stick to this certain thing because that's what you're known for and that's where the money is. And so, okay, I get it. I understand, I understand that from a business point of view. But for an artist point of view, we can't be, we can't be segregated like that. And so we'll always have the original product projects that we have, but we wanted to just be able to get as artistic and creative as possible. And that's, that's kind of where Arcade Assembly lands. So like, I'm curious for you, like, do you approach Arcade Assembly like differently from like Grey Days or your solo music? Uh, yeah, because the, uh, first of all, I'm writing with another singer and that's new for me. Um, I really do like it because Elias is obviously like he's 30 years into the business and um, he's been doing this like I, I don't even know how many albums Nonpoint put out. But um, it's it's been really fun to listen to his characteristics, his mannerisms, his lyrics and play off of them and then vice versa. He plays off of mine. I play off of his. And so we're we're starting to find this rhythm where, you know, my type of voice where does my type of voice fit in where does his type of voice fit in and how do we meld and mold that together for the song and so this is a lot different because it's a it's a duo singer it's a dual singer type situation oh no for sure well i very very much enjoyed the the debut single nothing's real i i really enjoy because obviously you're talking about with the two singers i always kind of like that complex because if done right it just adds to me another another layer to the song, especially when both like uh, vocalists like complement each other so well. It like to me it elevates the song. Yeah, I agree, and I've always liked it too. Um, I I love the idea of two vocalists. I've heard it I've heard it done wrong before, but um, I if it if it can be done correctly and tastefully, it brings another layer to the music that you know just doesn't exist. Oh, for sure. For sure. So kind of curious for you guys, like, is this going to be like a studio kind of collaboration project or will there eventually be plans to like have some shows or touring? I think that from the from the conversations I'm having, it sounds like we will be taking this out in 2025. I think that it will be in the genres of so we're talking to these producers. Um, and I, I think it could possibly be like a Vegas show or uh, or an EDM festival, you know, one of these one of these festivals that, you know, it may not be a, a 1000 percent rock band that we're going out and performing these songs with, although that's possible as well. But it does sound like we might be able to cross genre this and make it maybe a hybrid of rock and edm 
we want it to be able to fit into like a Tomorrowland or, you know, um, like a Vegas show. I did a Vegas, I did, I, I performed with a Vegas producer last year around this time last year. And, um, it was the funnest thing that I've done in a really long time because the, like EDM music has got the drops and it's got the buildups and it's got the drops and everybody knows when the buildup is coming, when the drop is hitting and, uh, it's, I, I don't know, man. Like, if we could turn, if we, my, you want to hear my dream is to turn these songs into something that we could take into a Vegas show and perform at a Omnia, Club Omnia, or something like that. I think that would be amazing. And I do hope that happens because I think it would be really cool, especially with, you know, Arcade Assembly having no real genres that you guys can do stuff like that and incorporate um, different elements of music and be a part of these festivals. I think that would be amazing. Plus, I'm sure, you know, the, the musicians you work with would be like star studded. I think it'll be a really cool event. Dude, can you imagine like all the all the artists that we collaborate with, we take everybody out and we do this like show with <laughs> I, w- I wish I could tell you everybody that we're talking to and working with right now, but it's not out yet. But it would just be amazing to do this at an EDM festival or in vegas you know one of these types of situations it would be nuts dude oh it would be well it would be well i look forward to seeing you know the way arcade assembly like progresses with that and dude that would be amazing i might fly out there wherever it is i might have to fly out there and be there you got tickets my friend you wherever whatever we're doing you're you're in you're in awesome i I appreciate it because it's gonna be a blast dude yeah yeah, but I did also want to. So with Arcade Assembly, so like, can you get? I, I not. I know you can't do too many details, but can you give any hints of like what kind of like the music or themes or lyrics? Like, what do you guys have in the works for new music? Yeah. So, like I said, what I can say is we're working with a producer named DJ Selva out of Brazil, and he uh, he writes for games, League of Legends, and all these other games, and so. This is, do you know anything about this world, the game, the online gaming world? I haven't really played any video games since in high school, so not too much. Dude, me neither. But apparently, new music is being discovered through these online gaming platforms. And like, first of all, if you go look at, if you go look up League of Legends, they have their own like record label or something. (laughs) This is the craziest thing. Um, but this is where music is being discovered now is like online gamers. And so he's been writing for these games for quite some time. But the thing is, is that when they typically write, it is, it is a nameless faceless producer. The the song is just stuck in a game. And so what we have decided was we're going to we're going to write the music as arcade assembly and then take it to the gamers uh, the gaming um, community and say here place this into your game as arcade assembly not just a nameless faceless producer. And I think that that's going to be the direction that we go is we're going to enter the online gaming community as arcade assembly and see if we can't take that world over well i really like that approach because like obviously i haven't haven't really heard of people like doing the usually they go to like you know spotify or like release music and they do albums touring all that so i do think it's definitely a unique approach with everything uh so i'm i'm curious for you because obviously i've discovered music through uh you know video games so i can definitely relate to that uh like obviously like tony hawk you know that series was that's how i discovered some of my favorite bands was through through that so i can definitely see the connection with that exactly and the idea would be we release it in the game but we also release it on all the dsps it also goes to octane radio like it's just another distribution channel um that hasn't been tapped i don't think the the way that it needs to be tapped i think that the gaming world is um a huge community of of people who want and need music so i think that that's probably the direction that we're going to go in 2025 is we're going to be writing some music for games 
Well, as I said, I really like that approach because it's definitely something different. And I do think, you know, again, I haven't played too many games, you know, from, t- you know, when I was in high school, like 10, about 10 years ago to now. But I do think that some of the music I, or some of the video games I've played, the music it sounds very generic, you know, like right. it doesn't have that like either hook to it. It just sounds like, you know, kind of just pre-programmed music. So I think bringing that back to where there is a band or like there is arcade assembly in music, I think will hopefully in theory elevate the video game and maybe create some epic scenes with, with arcade assembly music. I mean, can you imagine like, the way that games, the, the g- games are like movies these days. It's insane what they can do with games. And <clears throat> it's been wild to just watch, you know, some, some, f- n- n- like I said, nameless, faceless music. That's, that's pretty good music, but nobody knows who these artists are. And we're like, we'll come in and we'll be arcade assembly and we'll write for your game. How about that? All right, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Maybe I'll get back into gaming uh, because of it too. Dude, um, I'm, I'm from, I'm from super Nintendo world. Like I think the farthest I got was in 64. So I'm so far behind. Like I just have so much to learn. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, well, I'm a little bit younger, so I got up to the PS2, PS3, sort of. Yeah, uh, I do got a PlayStation 4, but like I, I rarely kind of play. I usually just watch YouTube on it. That's the main reason I have it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but I, I've been slowly getting back into it. I've been playing Grand Theft Auto uh, lately, kind of replaying that. You know, but uh, I don't know. Is it the best use of my time? Sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I I don't know if I miss it. Do you miss playing games? Like, do you? I I would say in high school, like, yeah. If I could go back in that time, yes, because like that was like first when like online play was like really starting to take off. Like, you know, Grand Theft Auto Five online. I had I would have like three or four people that we would get on, you know, get on and play like these missions or just have fun or kill each other, whatever, you know? Uh, but I, I miss that. But um, as for right now, like obviously between like working two jobs and doing Bro. this podcast and, uh, you know, going to school, you know, it, now there's not so much time. And a lot of my friends are kind of in that same boat of not having time to play. So yeah, yeah, I'm I do miss you. it though. I'm with you. I think, what I miss about that is having time. <laughs> like I, we don't have any time anymore to do anything. I think that I would like to have the time, uh, especially with where technology is like just getting on these headsets with your friends and your buddies and talking shit to each other while, you know, shooting each other in the face. Like that sounds fun to me. I wish I could do that. I don't have any time for that, but I, it sounds like a blast. It, de- it definitely is. And yeah, I, I um, I feel you on that with not having time. This whole adult thing, man. Man, adulting something. sucks, bro. I don't, uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't condone it at all. I know. It seems like the older I get, the more like crap I got to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I know. Eventually, though, we'll get to a point where we can't, like, we'll have to have somebody else take care of us. Really looking forward to that, you know? Exactly. Exactly. I would. Have, I, I do want to shift a little bit. I do also want to talk about Gray Days for a little bit. I saw you guys. You toured this year. I saw. You, I, I. I believe you guys were in England across the pond a little bit before Halloween. Yeah. So like, how is everything going with the band, dude? It's. Uh. So we got back from. We did the UK. We did Europe. Um. We were out for about three weeks. I think Germany. Um. And so that tour went really really well it was a lot of fun and the cool part about doing great days especially in europe and the uk is that a lot of these people didn't think that they'd ever get to see this because obviously chester passed away in 2017 and you know the band was just um reimagining the songs and so nobody even great days thought that this music would be played live and in 2022, I think it was 2022, late 2022, they reached out to me because um, of my connection with the Lincoln Park Tribute Band. And they just said, do you want to fly out, hang out for a few days and rehearse and see what happens? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I flew out there. I spent about four or five days with the guys. 
and just meeting him, hanging out with him. I knew Sean, uh, the drummer already. Um, we had been, you know, casual friends for about three years or so. And we got in the rehearsal studio. It worked. It sounded really good. And we had no intention of like going on tours or like even now we're still we're planning for another European tour for 2025. And all of this w was like we had we've never wanted to force gray days down anyone's throat because it's a sensitive topic. And so everything that we've done and everything we will do is fan dictated. So as long as fans want it, that's what we're going to do. So we did a European tour. We came back and toured a little bit in the U.S. We have a show um, right down the street from me at the Whiskey in Hollywood in December. And we will be taking the rest of the year off. And then we'll go out and do uh, we'll do Europe again in March. I know when I, I first saw it, uh, you know, like the, the announcement with Grey Days, um, I saw like some mixed reactions, like I, you know, with when, you know, when that announcement was made, but like, I really like the direction you guys have gone with it and all that. Like I've obviously I've heard, you know, previous interviews with you and, and the other band members as well. And you guys, I like that you're, you're it's very fan focused mm -hmm. uh, with everything. You guys are very thoughtful and respectful uh, with the band. Mm hmm. That, that was the idea, because again, we're not trying to force this down anyone's throats. Um, it's, it, it was, look, you want to know, you want to know the impact that this has on people. Um, almost every show that we do, I'm looking down and I'm seeing people just crying because it, it just means so much to them that they get to experience this. And the stories that I hear whenever we get off stage, we always do. We always go out and uh, hang out with the crowd at the merch booth, usually. And uh, the stories that I hear of how Chester inspired them to take a chance or you know stay alive, um, the the that tells me that what we're doing is right. There's always going to be naysayers, always, 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 and they're entitled to their opinion. But that doesn't phase me because I'm in the trenches with the people that enjoy it. And it means so much to them. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than the other guys in gray days. It's about the fans. And so that's why I don't really care about, you know, the one percent or two percent of people that don't like it because I get to experience pure joy with these people that come to the shows. Oh, for sure. Especially like, I really like your perspective on it with that. And like, I, I was going to ask about the fan reception and you already, you already talked about that, which was cool. Cause I, I was very curious, like how people are receiving you guys at this show, especially you have like tears on their face or like having, you know, them experience this moment they thought never would be possible, I think is incredible. And I'm all for it. Yeah, it, it is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever been a part of. Um just how special it is to everybody. And, um, you know, you want to know something really cool. So when the people respond online, the people that respond negatively online, when, when the announcement was made, I was like, yeah, I, I expected that. No problem. And then we start going out and playing live. And I get to build a relationship with all of the Great A's community. And it was funny because when, when negative comments started popping up, I didn't have to say anything. All it, it was it was the all the people that came out and saw us and the community that we're building. They're like, "No, you need to you need to relax because this was a special moment for us, and we're glad that they're doing this." And that was that's been a really cool thing where I was like, we don't have to say anything. And I think that it's a great position for you guys because like you you let your like hard work and your your show and your music speak for itself and the community you guys have built that you guys can keep doing your thing and like people are going to back you guys 100 percent with everything because you are as i said like doing you know the the correct way being very respectful and being all about the fans and they, they see that uh to support and defend you guys well i think that's one of the reasons why we decided not to put out music for two years because um the idea was look we were just supposed to do one show that was u fest 
um, in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona, in 2023. That was the only show we were supposed to do. And um, and it just turned into what it is now. But we were like, we're not, we were writing and recording new music, but we weren't releasing it or telling anybody about it because we wanted to make sure that we made our rounds respecting what has already been created. Oh, for sure. I think you guys, as I said, did everything right and, you know, consider it with everything. But uh, I also like, you guys are very conscious about the memory of Chester, which I think is, that's the ultimate part of, you know, great days with everything. And that is what I really like about you guys. And again, I've, I've listened to interviews, so, you know, read interviews, and that is like the, the utmost importance to you guys. And I really like that. Yeah, I appreciate that. that. That was the whole idea. So I'm glad that I'm glad that you see that. Of course. So I do got one more grade days question I did want to ask, and then we're starting to wrap up this interview. So curious, do you have a favorite grade days song to perform live? Yes, I do. My favorite grade days song to perform live is um, so I'll give you the ballad. Moray Sky is one of the most romantic songs that I get to perform live. And then um, She Shines is probably my favorite, like just get in the trenches like get in the mosh pit and get dirty kind of song i really love like i'll even get down in the mosh pit for some of those some of those songs oh, that is cool I, again great great picks of those like giving two different you know kind of sides you know with the valid and with the just the straight banger yeah uh, i i like that fan interaction I, I like when you know musicians are able to do that obviously safely you know with the crowd but um i very much like that and so i'm curious for you like what's been your experience when you jump in the pit um, uh it depends on which town i'm in when we went to uh so london london was a uh just emotional moment for everybody and so when i'm in the pit there it's just like tears and grabbing and just hugs and everything which was beautiful. Glasgow, I would get my ass kicked in Glasgow. Like, they just go hard. And so, like, I came out with bruises from that show. Um, and, you know, Funny, so Holland, we did Holland uh, as a kind of warm-up show in Amsterdam before we went over to the UK. And they're very proper, you know? They're very, like, you know, j just... Uh, I wouldn't say conservative, but very proper. And so that mosh pit is like, I, I was very safe in that mosh pit. But it's like, everybody was just moving and having fun. But there were no shoulders into people's chins, for sure. That is interesting. I, I haven't really asked like musicians that question yet. But like, that's very interesting. It really depends what country or city you're in. Very uh, much. It, you know, that kind of dictates what you're going to um walk into or jump into i should say jump so, into um, for sure <laughs> like i could tell you in every city in the u.s everybody has a different character so orlando florida they're always crazy i always get my ass kicked in orlando florida um fresno out here in california just north of me fresno goes hard as well but it's like violent like i'll come out with cuts and bruises and things like that i love it i love it like that's why i do it but it's i i, I need to know going in that i'm gonna i'm gonna need uh some bandages after that definitely definitely but it just, it's just so cool with that and again it just shows how diverse people are you know even just with the united states and abroad and it, it's so cool that people react differently to the music it, depending on where you are. I think that's what makes people human. I think that, you know, it just makes more variety of life. Yeah, it's very fun. I have a, I get to have a unique perspective on people and cultures and, you know, suburbs versus cities and uh, overseas, the UK versus the EU or Germany. It's like, um, it's very cool to get to know different cultures. And, um, but at the end of the day, it's just about good music. It's about community, and it's about having fun. Exactly, exactly. I couldn't say it any better. 
So now, as we're starting to close out this interview, so I'm curious for you, Arcade Assembly, great days. What are the plans for the rest of 2024 and looking into early 2025? I've been on the road for most of 2024. So I am going to stay here in LA um, and rest for the next two months. I have a, a few one-off shows, like local shows. And like we're, like I said, we're, Great A's is going to do a show over at Whiskey uh, with Julie and Kay. 2025 is going to be crazy. Um, Great A's is going to be doing a uh, European run. Again, a very short European run. But we're also doing the Mio Arena on March 22nd with, surprisingly, a Linkin Park tribute band called Hybrid Theory. And so that's going to be very fun and interesting. Arcade Assembly is going to, we're going to be doing some live shows for sure. I don't know how much I can say right now at this point, but we're going to be going out. We're already working on the live performance and how that's going to work. Um, Cause like I said, we're trying to do, we're trying to do lots of different genres and lots of different, bringing a lot of different people in this and, how that comes together um we're going to be working that out for the rest of the year and figuring that out early into 2025 we'll still be working it out so i'd be on the lookout for something live with arcade assembly probably the summer of 2025 well right on well i'd be looking forward to that uh you know when that when that does come to fruition yeah. but uh chris thank you so much for stopping by super cool radio I had a fantastic time chatting Dude. with you you're awesome, bro. Any show you want to come to, you let me know. Um, you're welcome at all of them. You come hang out backstage with us, all right? I'm looking forward to it, and I will definitely let you know when I can make it out to a show. Cool. Let's do it. But please check out support, uh, Great Days, and Arcade Assembly. I will leave some links for them in the description of this podcast. Chris, I really appreciate your time. It was fantastic to meet you. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you, and thanks for having me on. Of course, for Chris Hodges, I'm your host always, Matthew Thomas. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this episode of Super Cool Radio. And remember, stay frosty. Yeah.